Hi guys and welcome back to Contract Law. We are doing the videos for Offer and Acceptance and we are up to video number four and this is the video that begins our exploration of the notion of acceptance. So let's get back into the Prezi and have a look at acceptance. So what exactly is acceptance so far as the law is concerned? Well, it means pretty much what you think it would mean. It's unqualified agreement to the terms of an offer. The emphasis there is on unqualified agreement and you'll see why in just a moment. It has to be made in the manner stipulated by the offeror. So that if they've actually uh, said in the offer, well, you must reply to me uh, in writing by snail mail uh, by a certain date, then you're going to have to do it that way. Um, other than that, if there's nothing stipulated, it might be by words, by conduct, anything that indicates unqualified agreement. Um, what is the importance of all of this? As I said at the very beginning in the first video, afterwards, once there has been an unqualified agreement, you have offer acceptance and... You got yourself a deal! Bingo, as long as all the other prerequisites are there, you've got your consideration, your certainty of terms and all of that good stuff, then the contract will spring into being henceforth. So the next logical question is who exactly can do the accepting? Well, only the offeree or acceptor nowadays can do the accepting. Okay, so if A makes an offer to B, only B can accept the offer um, if C is standing by, they can't chip in and purport to accept the offer that was directed to B. And we talk about uh, privity elsewhere in this unit. What are the exceptions here? And yes, don't we love those exceptions? Uh, principally to do with um, those unilateral type contracts where one person's kind of broadcasting uh, an offer rather broadly. Um, in those circumstances, like we saw in Carlisle, anyone can accept, obviously. Um, in a reward kind of situation, so a more particular subset of those kind of offers to all the world, uh, it's intended that only the first person is going to be able to accept. Again, just common sense there. The next logical question is what exactly can be accepted? And here we need to see unequivocal acceptance of the terms of the offer as they have been originally presented to the offeree. Okay, very important that. Okay, if the offeree starts to change the terms or add new terms, what they are doing is not giving a qualified acceptance of the offer that was on the table. They are rejecting the offer that was originally presented and they are instead making a counter offer, a fresh offer to the original person uh, the, that made the offer. Okay, so now the offeror and the offeree have kind of swapped places, if you will. Um, Turner Kempson and Co. just is an example of how strictly courts can construe this requirement. Uh, so there we had a sale. Um, what happened was they added a term um, in relation to, to delivery. Uh, they wanted it in three lots with 10 days in between. Nothing substantive changed, but extra that extra detail added. And there was a slight change in the way that the um, items were described. In that case, no, there was no acceptance there. That was actually a rejection of the original offer and a presentation of a counter offer. So a new offer there. Hide and wrench, classic scenario here. What do you want to sell? I want to sell my property, thousand mm, pounds. Actually, yeah, you know what? I can give you nine fifty. Uh, no thanks. And then the uh, the offeree goes away, rather disappointed that the nine fifty wasn't accepted. And then they come back and say, actually, you know what? I will pay the thousand pounds. And that's definitely a counter offer, which the original offeror can then accept or reject. Okay. Sometimes here, and the text goes into this, you'll, you'll get into a bit of a battle of the forms where you know one company is offering to deal on their particular set of standard terms and conditions. Uh, they send it out to uh, the person that's going to be doing the purchasing, if you will, and then the purchaser replies back with 
their own standard terms and conditions. Uh, what happens there if the original person that made the original offer sent their original T's and C's off to the purchaser, then signs the purchaser's standard form, which one's going to apply uh, in that case uh, that I'm talking about, Butler Machine Tool. Uh, it was the uh, purchaser's order form that had the standard T's and C's uh, that then governed the transaction. So you need to be careful about what standard T's and C's are um, applying in a certain scenario and whether there have been multiple instances of uh, standard T's and C's being sent. Uh, the text also goes into Masters and Cameron a bit. Um, that's a bit of a discussion for another day, I think. Suffice to say here in terms of um, acceptance and what can be accepted, um, Masters and Cameron is the case that sets out the, um, the various different stages of negotiation and how certain or uncertain the parties are about the terms that they're going to be agreeing to. Sometimes the terms will be fairly well agreed and, it, and the parties will intend to be bound right there and then. They might say, you know, subject to contract or something like that. Uh, but in actual fact, they've intended to be bound straight away. It's just that they want to reduce that agreement to writing. In other times, you know, the um, the terms and conditions may have been ag agreed, the offer's been made, the acceptance has occurred. Things seem to have formed into a contract, but the parties clearly from the circumstances intend there to be no binding effect to it unless and until a proper document is drawn up and everyone has signed off. So just be aware that um, Masters and Cameron is a significant case that we'll have to leave discussion of uh, to a later day. Okay, so how do you accept an offer? <laughs> this might seem like common sense and it is. Um, acceptance must be communicated by the offeree to the offeror. If the offeror stipulates a certain manner of acceptance, as I said before, that has to be complied with. However, and there's one really big exception to this, you need to be quiet. Silence cannot be stipulated as the manner to accept an offer. Why is that? Again, you might think we're in common sense. Yes, it is common sense because in one way you kind of darn if you do and darn if you don't. You know, if you don't say anything. Uh, because you don't particularly want the deal, you're not interested, well, all of a sudden, you know, you might find yourself trapped. Um, but then again, you might want the contract and it's told you to be quiet. So <laughs> it's it's a bit of a uh, funny scenario there. Obviously, you can't stipulate that silence will constitute acceptance. If the offeror doesn't actually stipulate a manner for acceptance, then you can pretty much uh, go for gold and, and accept in most ways, although um, logically most acceptances will occur in the same manner as the offer was made. So if the offer was made uh, via email, often you will just respond by email. Um, there are two fairly separate issues that we need to discuss here. Uh, firstly, acceptance by instantaneous communication and secondly, the postal rule. Okay, so let's have a little look at those. So for the category of uh, communication that we call instantaneous, uh, the case law has kind of sorted itself out as to what falls into this category of communication. So obviously we've got two parties in front of each other, in person it's going to be instantaneous. My phone is also considered instantaneous and uh, telex, wow, that's an antiquated form of technology, a teleprinter also, the fax, well, that's pretty much almost died out except for maybe doctor's surgeries uh, and universities possibly. <laughs> I'll get it. Fred Flintstone. Um, the general rule for instantaneous communication is that acceptance will occur when the offeror receives the communication. So they've said to the other person, do you want to do X? The other person has said, yes, please, I would love to. Uh, the original offeror has um, heard that communication and they have received it, therefore the acceptance has taken effect. Similarly, by phone, um, 
telex, teleprinter, fax, and so on. Uh, also, once that person, the, for example, on fax, once the person uh, receives the fax, reads it, uh, that is when the communication uh, has been uh, legally received and uh, the acceptance will become effective. The situation is very different in terms of the postal rule. So where you've got an acceptance um, served by post, um, you have this funny little antiquated corner of contract law that's grown up around you know, mostly 19th and 20th century communication um, technology. Reaching it, money. Not quite, Fred. But different principles apply here. Um, Telegram also falls into this particular category of communication and therefore uh, the acceptance is calculated the same way as by post. Um, because the postal rule can have some fairly significant effects on a transaction and the party's rights, um, you have to be very clear that the parties know and intend that the postal rule will apply or at least that acceptance is going to be communicated by post. So you have these two requirements here. Firstly, the parties must contemplate acceptance by mail or telegram. Secondly, if so, the contract is formed as soon as the letter is posted. Yep, I'll say that again, as soon as the letter is posted. So, oh, or in the case of telegrams, if you've actually gone into the post office and uh, told the postmaster uh, the content of your acceptance. Okay, so as soon as that happens, then the acceptance has been communicated and is effective. The risk here, obviously, for the offeror is that the um, offeree or acceptor may have actually done their accepting and they just, the offeror does not know it yet, okay? They haven't actually had the letter in their hot little hands and gone, hmm, okay, Mary does want to buy my car. Um, the offer has been made, perhaps by post, um, maybe. I don't know if anyone has actually been out and done a telegram. I haven't, uh, I, gee, I don't think I've actually ever sent a telegram. My sister, I remember going as a kid with my sister who, who arranged a telegram, and that was many years ago. A Western Union telegram commands attention. Contract awarded. Can you ship by first of month? Reply by wire. And back to the topic, uh, that is the risk, obviously, to the offeror, that they may not know. So the other party has gone, posted their letter, the telegram uh, has been uh, formulated and uh, given to the postmaster. In both of those scenarios, uh, the acceptance has become effective. So looking a little bit more closely at the requirement that the parties contemplate that acceptance might occur by post or telegram. Um, normally, this will be fairly easy uh, to, to show if the offer itself was made by post. Okay, because as we said before, generally speaking, the acceptance will be in the same form, in the same manner uh, as the offer was communicated. Um, However, where there has been a, a history of contentious dealings between the parties and if lawyers are involved, that's all getting a bit nasty, uh, then a court might actually say, mm, you know what, given the high risk nature of this transaction and uh, the animosity between the parties, uh, you know what, I don't think, the court doesn't think uh, that uh, it was contemplated that acceptance could occur by post, and that was the scenario that happened in the Talaman case. Um, it might be in the contemplation of the parties um, that acceptance would occur by post if they live a long way apart. However, you know, as with most of these cases, um, most of them were in centuries gone by. And nowadays, if you live a long distance apart, um, I would say you'd probably be more likely to communicate by email. But uh, anyway, uh, that is one, one principle that you might argue in uh, a certain case if the facts demanded it. So Henthorne and Fraser is the case there that helps out with that. Generally speaking, as I said, the court will look at surrounding circumstances. So certainly in the Talaman case, notwithstanding that um, communication had been by post, it was held that nothing short of actual communication uh, and receipt of the acceptance was going to be sufficient 
for the acceptance to become effective. So courts are going to use their common sense there. How do you get around the postal rule? As I said, it has its risks. Um, if the offeror says that actual notification is required, um, nothing short of me getting your letter saying, uh, hello, it's Mary, I want to buy your car, um, then you know that's the way that it's going to have to run. So even if the letter is sent by post, nothing short of actual notification is going to do. So in the Bresson and Holwell cases, you had the offerors saying things like, uh, acceptance had to be by notice in writing to the offeror at any time and then specifying a certain time. Uh, where you use words like notice in writing to me, notice in writing to the offeror, uh, that will tend to flag the issue that the, the offeror actually wants to receive the communication before acceptance is effective. Okay, and therein the postal rule will bite the dust, so to speak. What about emails? Well, you might think that they just naturally fall into that uh, category of instantaneous communication and therefore uh, acceptance will be effective once the email is open and read. Um, oh, there has been quite a long tail of uncertainty in this area. There was a 2009 case of Oliverville and Plotwig. Uh, 2009 FCA 522 that did hold that emails were part of that instantaneous category of communication. Um, but there, like I said, there's been a fair bit of uncertainty, so now we actually find we have legislation that helps out. Interestingly, to my mind, um, it probably helps an offeror out a little more if they don't actually designate a specific email address. If they don't and they say something like just send it to me by email, then you have this two-pronged test which runs along the lines of this. Acceptance is re received when the email is capable of being retrieved from the address it was sent to and the offeror is aware that the electronic communication has been sent to that address. What does that mean? Essentially when it's been downloaded and read. Okay, so that kind of makes sense in terms of, you know, that instantaneous category of communication and uh, the acceptance being effective once it's actually received. Um, a little uh, trickier, perhaps, when you actually do designate a specific email address. In that case, the legislation says acceptance is received when the email is capable of being retrieved by the offerer at the specified address. So we've dropped out that second prong in uh, the previous uh, section. Um, so essentially it will be received when the email hits the server. When the email hits the server. Not when it actually gets to your particular email inbox and you see it there in front of you ready to be read. So once it hits the server, that's when acceptance is effective. Problems there, um, things like you may have firewalls that uh, stop the email from getting from your server to your inbox. So that could be an issue. You might have various different filters set up in your inbox that somehow prevent uh, the email popping up in your inbox so it's gotten to the server but not actually to you. Uh, also things like out of office um, uh, filters as well, junk, spam, all of that stuff can interfere with uh, the email getting from the server to your inbox and therefore being read. So just a little bit of trickiness on the part of the legislation there. I'm not sure whether that was intended but that's how it seems to run. Um, Upshot though is that the legislation says that you can certainly determine receipt differently. For example, you can still specify, even if you're exchanging emails and doing a deal that way, that acceptance will be effective when the email is downloaded and read if you wish to do so, just for a bit of um, extra added certainty, a bit of belts and braces approach as we would say in the contract drafting game. Aha, finally, we come to revocation of acceptance. So what happens if you've said 
yes, I would like to do that deal. I like those terms. I'd like to be bound. <laughs> Not in any kind of artificial way at all. Um, and McNeil would love that. Uh, the general rule, <laughs> revocation of acceptance is possible only if it reaches the offeror before the acceptance does. Why is that? Obviously, because we've had that magical moment, haven't we? We've had the meeting of minds. We've had the consensus ad idem. So offer acceptance and you can't suddenly go, oh, whoops, sorry. No, I didn't mean that. I had my fingers crossed behind my back. No. Once you actually um, accept, you're bound. And then if you purport to withdraw, then uh, you can run into some serious problems. It will probably constitute a repudiation for which the other party can terminate and sue you for damages. So ugly little mess there, which we get to talk about later on when we talk about breach and termination. But what happens if your revocation does actually magically reach the offer or before the acceptance does? What's the legal chain of events there? The offer terminates on receipt of the revocation. So when the acceptance is received later on, the offer has already been rejected by the earlier revocation. So there's nothing to accept anymore. Okay, the acceptance just kind of floats in like a feather after all the actual damage has been done, if you know what I mean. Now, how does that all play out uh, in terms of the postal rule? Um, the general consensus is, and this is just a general consensus because there are conflicting views on this, um, but the general consensus is that if you have posted your acceptance by snail mail, or telegram. Uh, you can't then use a more immediate form of communication to revoke that postal acceptance, okay? Just because it reaches the offeror's ears in reality before the snail mail letter gets there, the problem is that once that snail mail letter was put into the post box, that is when the contract was formed. So then when you've gotten back to your car, you've picked up your mobile phone and gone, oh, sorry, Joe, I really didn't want to buy that item. Uh, it's too late because that magical moment has already happened once you've put the letter in the letterbox. Uh, so Newton Holdings is a relatively recent case that um, tends to establish that fairly strict uh, adherence to the postal rule there. Uh, so that is acceptance. As I always say, if you have any queries or questions, post something up on Moodle, post something up on Facey, give me a call, send me an email. Let's keep chatting and I hope to see you in a Zoom sometime soon. Until then, Bye for now, guys.